Hello and welcome to a summary of All You Need to Know about The Explorer's Daughter by Carrie Herbert. Now, I'm going to read and explain this extract in depth and the version of the extract that I will read through is what appears in the Pearson Edexcel International GCSE Anthology. Now, bear in mind in terms of background and context, Herbert as a small child lived with a family among the Inuit people and this was a really harsh environment that she grew up in in the Arctic and in 2002 she revisited this area staying near Thule and this essay is based upon this visit. So I'll explain the meaning related to this text, the language devices that you need to be aware of when analysing it and other contextual factors that you find helpful as you study this text. So let's get started. Now what I'll do is I will read through the passage and then explain language techniques that you need to be aware of but also the meaning behind them. So let's begin with this paragraph. Two hours after the last of the hunters had returned and eaten, Narwhal was spotted again, this time very close. Within an hour, even those of us on shore could, with a naked eye, see the plumes of spray from the narwhal catching the light in a spectral play of colour. Two large pods of narwhal circled in the fjord, often looking as if they were going to merge, but always slowly, methodically, passing each other by. Scrambling back up to the lookout, I looked across the glittering kingdom in front of me and took a sharp intake of breath. The hunters were dotted around the ford. The evening light was turning butter gold, glinting off man and well and catching the soft billows of smoke from a lone hunter's pipe. From where we sat on the lookout, it looked as though the hunters were close enough to touch the narwhal with their bare hands, and yet they never moved. Distances are always deceptive in the Arctic, and I felt wondering if the narwhal existed at all or were instead mischievous tricks of the shifting light. Now, of course, what this opening does is it introduces this Arctic area, but also it really introduces these creatures, but also the lifestyle of these Inuit people who many of us perhaps are not very familiar with. Now, this opening, essentially two hours after, this is an adverbial phrase of time, and the passage starts in media ray. What this basically means is it starts right in the middle of the action and we're thrown right into the lifestyle that she was experiencing as she lived amongst the Inuit. So we're really just thrown right into the middle of this action. Furthermore, this complex sentence, this initial opening complex sentence, creates some tension and anticipation. We start wondering, oh, what's happening? This, these narwhal have been spotted. We want to know what's going to happen next. There's more language referring to temporal time. So it started off with two hours and then now it's narrowed down to an hour. So now this focus on time shows it's a countdown. There's some building tension as we're reading through this passage. And then she uses the hyperbole, plumes of spray, to really emphasize the beauty of the narwhal and how majestic in many ways they appear. Carrie Herbert then mentions a spectral play of colour and this vivid and dramatic imagery adds all the more to the beauty and the majesty of the narwhal. We are really, really drawn to these creatures who, and they seem really mysterious, there's a lot of mystique around them. Now, the repetition of these pronouns essentially now makes us see things from her perspective. And of course, remember that she's back revisiting the area. So we're seeing things really through her lens, the lens of somebody who is fairly westernized, has come from a fairly busy culture and is now going to a far more remote culture. The metaphor, Glittering Kingdom, really emphasises the beauty of both the narwhal but also this Arctic area. And so this is such beautiful language and it makes us all as readers really enticed. It's also quite idyllic. Then there's a mention of the sharp intake of breath. And what this adverb does is it suddenly makes us really aware there's something that's suddenly happening. The simple sentence, the hunters are dotted around the fjord, essentially now makes us realise what's caused her, as well as probably other people near her, to suddenly focus in. The hunters, the narrowing in, what's happening? Furthermore, the colourful imagery that's used in contrast, so the mention of butter gold and the light, what this does is it creates a semantic field of colour. And bear in mind, semantic field is two or more words that are related to a similar category. And of course, the colour of butter gold, but also the light, this all ties into colour. And again, there's this contrast between something that's, there's an underlying tension, but also this underlying tension is almost in paradise. She then uses a sibilance, soft billows of smoke from a lone hunter's pipe, and this makes us focus in on the hunters. 
Then she talks about man and well and the juxtaposition of these two creatures. Of course, we as men, but also the narwhals shows the reason why she's so shocked, why she took a sharp intake of breath. There's going to be a face-off of some kind. She then also mentions how distances in terms of vision in the Arctic area can be quite deceptive. And this is emphasized through the alliteration of distances and deceptive. So let's carry on to the next part of the passage. Narwhal rarely stray away from high Arctic waters, escaping only to the slightly more temperate waters towards the Arctic Circle in the dead of winter, but never entering the warmer southern seas. In summer, the hunters of Thor are fortunate to witness the annual return of the narwhal in the Inglefield Ford, on the side of which we now sat. The narwhal is an essential contributor to the survival of the hunters in the high Arctic. The matak, or blubber, of the well is rich in necessary minerals and, uh, minerals and vitamins, and in a place where the climate prohibits the growth of vegetables or fruit, this rich source of vitamin C was the one reason that the Eskimos have never suffered from scurvy. For centuries, the blubber of the wells was also the only source of light and heat, and the dark, rich meat is still a valuable part of the diet for both man and dogs. A single narwhal can feed a team of dogs for an entire month. Its single ivory task, which can go to six feet in length, was used for harpoon tips and handles for other. Now, before we move on, let's have a look at some of the language techniques. So here, she mentions the Arctic twice, and the repetition reinforces this location. Furthermore, her mention of the temperate waters, this personifies the water. It seems almost that everything around her is really vivid and very filled with life. Furthermore, the adjective, the narwhal being an essential, so this word essential, this adjective emphasizes the importance of the narwhal well in the ecosystem of the Arctic. Furthermore, the semantic field of nutrition, so vitamins, minerals, vegetables, fruit, what this does is firstly, it makes it relatable for us so we can now really start understanding things in terms of language. So she speaks a language that we can understand as outsiders, but more importantly, what this does is also emphasize furthermore how the narwhal, even if they're really important in the ecosystem, they're also important in terms of being consumed by these people that live in the Arctic. Furthermore, when she mentions the only source of light and heat, this bright imagery uh, shows how important the wells are in the ecosystem of the Arctic and of course also the importance in the diets of these hunters. And furthermore, this importance is emphasized by the mention of the dark rich meat, this vivid image talking about the flesh of these narwhal emphasizes how they're really, really important in terms of consumption for these men and their dogs and their survival. Also, the adjective, the pre-modifier single to describe the ivory task of this narwhal emphasizes just how large the task is, but also, of course, by extension, it emphasizes just how vast this well really is. Furthermore, the use of alliteration, harpoon tips and handles, and especially harpoon and handles, emphasizes these weapons that are used as a result of, or rather created as a result of this ivory task. So there's some irony that the narwhal's ivory task is used by man to create weapons which can be used to kill them. So let's carry on. Hunting implements. Although the ivory was found to be brittle, and not hugely satisfactory as a weapon for carving protective tulip packs and even as a central beam for the small ancient dwellings. Strangely, the task seems to have little use for the narwhal itself. They do not use the task to break through the ice as a breathing hole, nor will they use it to catch or attack prey, but rather the primary use seems to be to disturb the top seabed in order to catch the arctic halibut, for which they have particular pre predilection. Often, the ends of the tasks are worn down or even broken from such usage. The women clustered in the knoll on the lookout, binoculars pointing in every direction, each woman focusing on her husband or family member, occasionally spinning round at a small gasp or jump as one of the women saw a hunter near a narwhal. Each wife knew her husband instinctively and watched the progress intently. It was crucial to her that her husband catch a narwhal. It was part of the stable diet and some of them. So now, 
going back to this opening sentence bear in mind that of course it starts off when she mentions its single ivory task which can grow up to six feet length was used for harpoon tips and handles for other hunting implements so this is just a continuation from that sentence and then she uses the parenthesis to further explain the use of the ivory to create essentially weapons so what this parenthesis does and parenthesis is just another fancy way of saying brackets what this does is it further adds to our knowledge and our intrigue of this narwhal and of course it also adds to our knowledge of how their tasks are used for weapons of course we find that the, the ivory was too brittle and not helpful in uh, the hunter's work Furthermore, the repetition of the task. Again, there's this paragraph really, really focuses in on this particular part of the narwhal's body. And it's interesting, of course, this focus shows that actually this narwhal is a little bit harmless. So even if it has this really massive intimidating task, actually it's a very little use of the narwhal itself. So it's a harmless creature, even if it's so vast. Furthermore, the use of this complex sentence, essentially, she uses a syndeton. So remember, asyndentic listing or syndeton is when there's a list of different parts of a sentence and they're listed without a conjunction, without and, but, because. Now, this listing, what this does is it now continues to build the tension and anticipation. People are clustering. There's something that's happening. We are starting to wonder what's going on. Furthermore, she then uses the adverb intently to emphasize further how everybody in this area is really focusing on the hunters who have gathered, but of course, by extension, the narwhal. Furthermore, the term crucial, the idea of the criticalness of this hunt shows just how high stakes this hunt is to the people that live in the Arctic. So she states, it was crucial to her that her husband catch a narwhal. It was part of their staple diet. And some of them attack and meat could be sold to other hunters who hadn't been so lucky, bringing in some much needed extra income. So of course, this is high stakes because actually the narwhal being killed and caught, this is what helps feed the hunters. And that this is what helps them keep going in terms of even making payments and earning money. Every hunter was in the water. It was like watching a vast waterborne game with the hunters spread like a net around the sound. The narwhal are intelligent creatures, their senses are keen, and they talk to one another under the water. Their hearing is particularly developed and they can hear the sound of a paddling kayak from a great distance. That was why the hunters had to sit so very still on the water. One hunter was almost on top of a pair of narwhal and they were huge. He gently picked up his harpoon and aimed. In that split second, my heart leapt for both Hunter and Narwhal. I urged the man on in my head. He was so close and so brave to attempt what he was about to do. He was miles from land on a flimsy kayak and could easily be capsized and drowned. The hunter had no rifle, only one harpoon with two heads and one bladder. It was a foolhardy exercise and one that could only respire respect. And yet, at the same time, my heart also urged the Narwhal to dive, to leave, to survive. Now here, firstly, the pre-modifier much needed extra income. Again, this makes us really empathise with the hunters, why they need to hunt these narwhal and kill them. Furthermore, this simple sentence really focuses in our attention on the hunters. They're now really closing in on their prey. And the simile, like watching a vast waterborne game, it's interesting because the simile shows that it's almost a game, it's something fun, but actually there's nothing fun to it. This is basically to do with life or death. The hunters, if they're not careful, they could die and they could even possibly drown. But also the narwhal, if they're not careful, they will get caught and killed. So there's a lot of tension here now. Furthermore, on the one hand, whilst she's really created a lot of empathy for the hunters, we really feel sorry for them and we want them to do really well, we also want the narwhal to escape and the adjective intelligent to describe how they're intelligent creatures creates empathy in our eyes for these narwhal. Furthermore, the alliteration, they talk and as well the, the verbs really give these narwhal their specific and their special personalities. 
Furthermore, the juxtaposition, which was is being reinforced, so before it was man and well, now it's hunter and narwhal. It makes us feel really convicted. We want to be on the side of the people that live in the Arctic. They need to survive. However, we also feel that the narwhal deserve to live. So we feel really conflicted. And this confliction is, of course, also reflected in, the, in Carrie Herbert herself. She was watching this and she feels really conflicted. Now, when it, she describes how the hunter gently picked up his harpoon, this soft movement, the, the, the adverb gently, is quite ironic because he's about to do something that's really shocking. Furthermore, she then mentions how her heart left for both Hunter and Narwhal, which brings home this feeling of confliction. She feels really, really scared for the Narwhal, but also equally scared for the Hunter. She's really trying to be on both sides. And of course, this is why she feels so conflicted. Moreover, the intensifier so, which is repeated, shows how Carrie Herbert is really, really wrapped up in this issue that she's seen before her and she much like the ladies and the women who want their husbands to catch narwhal she also feels really really caught up in this essentially this vast waterborne game moreover the semantic field of weapons rifle and harpoon essentially starts to really drive home the point that this is a very violent and also dangerous activity Furthermore, the rule of three here, to dive, survive, to, to dive, to leave, to survive, as well as the use of tricolon, shows just how she really, really is willing the narwhal to escape somehow. She then mentions, this dilemma stayed with me the whole time that I was in Greenland. So now she gets right to the heart of her own feeling of confliction. Carrie Herbert goes on. I understand the harshness of life in the Arctic and the needs of the hunters and their families to hunt and live on animals and sea mammals that we demand to be protected because of their beauty. And I know that one cannot afford to be sentimental in the Arctic. How can you possibly eat seal? I've been asked over and over again. True, the images that bombarded us several years ago of men battering seals for their fur hasn't helped the issue of popular hunting, but the Inuit do not kill seals using this method, nor do they kill for sport. They use every part of the animals they kill, and most of the food and thaw is still bought by the hunter-gatherers and fishermen. Imported goods can only ever account for part of the food supply. There's still only one annual supply ship that makes it through the ice to Kanak, and the small twice-weekly plane from West Greenland can only carry a certain amount of goods. Hunting is still an absolute necessity in Thor. So of course now here, what she starts doing is really trying to explain to us the perspective of the hunters in Greenland and of course the Inuits. And this first person plural pronoun shows how we as a people, especially in the West, really sometimes become really self-righteous. We get on our high horse about protecting these creatures, but we forget that they're hunters and communities that rely on them for their own survival. Furthermore, the verb demand shows how we sometimes do this, but almost out of ignorance because we don't understand that this is all part of an, a, a vast ecosystem, which includes also the hunters that need to survive, much like the narwhal as well need to survive. Furthermore, the rhetorical question, how can you possibly eat seals, just shows how people can be quite self-righteous and very judgmental on matters that they don't quite know. Also, we really start understanding the challenge that hunters as well as fishermen in this part of Greenland face and this language, so hunter-gatherers and fishermen, these nouns essentially show how remote and simplistic their community is. They're not doing this just for the sake of it or just for sport. This is important. It's important to kill these narwhal because of their survival. Now, Carrie Herbert ends with a declarative sentence. Hunting is still an absolute necessity in Thor. And what this declarative sentence shows is that she now really realizes the blunt reality of life in the Arctic. We can't afford to be too sentimental about things such as killing these creatures because actually this hunting community rely on them for their survival. But of course, we also need to be careful about killing them for sport. So it's a really delicate balance, which she is trying to emphasize through this declarative sentence however it's something that cannot completely be eliminated because eliminating hunting these narwhal is essentially sentencing this community of people to death 
because that's all. If you found this video useful, please make sure you visit our website, which is www.firstreetutors.com. There you will find lots of revision materials and useful materials when it comes to answering any questions related to this and indeed other extracts from this anthology. Thank you so much for listening.